ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us again for the Indo-Pacific series, Aerospace, Defence and Security Technology Market Trends, opportunity, Opportunities Between India, Australia and ASEAN. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the Executive Editor and Director for My Security Media based in Sydney. And we run this series with our co-hosts, uh, Aerospace and Defence Consultants Association of India. And normally my co-host, Raman Sapuri, uh, he's just dropped off. He'll be on uh, again shortly. And this is, as I mentioned, episode four. And we run a four domain uh, focus in this particular series. This is a, a 10 uh, webinar series, uh, aerospace and space, defense and national security, cyber security and critical technology and cities and infrastructure. These sessions are recorded and they are also live on YouTube. And I'm just gonna fire that out right now while I'm speaking. And my security TV on our YouTube channel is available. Um, this is a, uh, we have a, a panel session. Each will be providing um, a, a presentation, but if you have questions, you can post them on your chat there as well. And uh, I'll be able to moderate those. As always, uh, we've been doing very well with our weekly webinar series. We always have an esteemed panel. Uh, and in this week, we have Dr. Subha Rayo Paluri, who is the founder, chairman and managing director for Ananth Technologies based in Hyderabad in India. Dr. Subha Rayo, thank you very much for joining us this particular week. Looking forward to your session. Um, we also have Dr. Malcolm Davis, senior analyst for the Australian Strategic Poly Policy Institute uh, based in Canberra. Malcolm, uh, pleasure to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. And Yochi Kamiyama, who is the policy research researcher, uh, Japan Institute for Space and Security, based in Tokyo. I did take a guess, Yochi, but I imagine you're based in Tokyo. Very good. Um, and we are waiting on Glenn Tyndall, who is the CEO of Communication Systems for EOS, otherwise Electro Optic Systems. Uh, and I'll chase Glenn up once uh, we get underway. And in fact, while uh, I have, just double checking, he's not in the audience one moment. No. Okay, so I'll follow up on, on Glenn. But Glenn um, is also based, he's based in Canberra also, uh, and EOS uh, is involved obviously in the defense and communication uh, technology space. So hopefully Glenn will be able to join us. As always, before we hear from our panelists, uh, just a quick run up. We've, uh, we've covered smart cities and strategy. These are all available on My Security TV on the YouTube playlist on National Cyber Security Strategy for Episode 2. And last week we had a cross with India, the Set Land Warfare Studies, and also uh, ASPE, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, Dr. John Coyne, looking at COVID 19 and its challenges. So it's good to now get into the space domain. Uh, goodness knows we probably all wanna get off planet Earth right now, the way things are running week to week. Um, we normally just run off some news. I'm not gonna to spend too much time, but uh, I thought I'd highlight Sarosh Bana, our Mumbai correspondent wrote, beg your pardon, wrote a, uh, a series on India. So I'll send that link out in the show notes, uh, just in terms of how India is uh, obviously keeping up with the US uh, and there's a bit of news around the Joint Strike Fighter, the JF-35 uh, also. Uh, Australia's released a code of practice. This is only a voluntary set of me measures, uh, but for securing the internet of things for consumers uh, based on 13 principles. Uh, we'll have a bit more of a look into that. We might even touch on that a bit more next week, but uh, certainly a document worth having a look at uh, from Raman. And Raman, thank you very much for joining us. I see you're on there now, well done. Um, 100K tech job openings uh, in India. So really trying to ramp up in the tech space uh, as COVID-19 really is starting to impact uh, on India as well. And it's certainly something to watch. Uh, and on the back of that, given that we have a guest from Tokyo, uh, this is Japan's SoftBank, $150 million fundraising uh, on the Bengaluru based EdTech startup, um, sorry, Unacademy. Uh, now considered a unicorn uh, in India, thanks to global data for that, uh, valued at 1.5 billion, a threefold jump in the last funding round in February. So uh, SoftBank, 
uh, something to watch and Unicademy uh, definitely one to have a look at. Uh, Roman was already on top of that news, so thank you. But this is on the Asia Pacific Security Magazine. Um, that's pretty much the news of the day. I didn't really want to go too much. There's been a lot happening. Uh, just some main events before we hear from our panellists. Uh, 3D Printing World, uh, again, um, in India, 5th and 6th of December. And this is a virtual conference uh, for um, Raman. Please uh, remind me, Dr. Shabar, was it? Yeah, Dr. Subar. Yep. Subar, yes, uh, running this particular series, Building Opportunities in the Challenging Times of COVID Pandemic. Um, we ran a, a successful webinar on 3D printing a few weeks ago. Uh, that we can uh, send the link in. Uh, we've just opened the Top Women in Security in Malaysia Awards. Uh, nominations are now open on our asiantechsec.com website. So worth having a look in partnership with Wisekra, Malaysian Women in Security, ISACA Malaysia Chapter and ACES International Malaysia Chapter also. In Singapore, we're partnering with the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore uh, Hack the Box, Marsh, and uh, Dr. Magda Chelly in particular. Uh, so this is for women only, for girls, CTF. It's the second series that's going to be on September the 12th. So worth having a look at that if you're in Singapore and you're a woman also. The 30th of September with the Australia-Israel Chamber of Commerce, uh, looking at Silicon Valley um, VC funding. Uh, particularly in the COVID-19 environment. So I'm being, again, 30th of September with the AICC here in Australia, but being virtual, you can log in anywhere. That's with Larry Lopez uh, and Aaron Gushenberg, who is the chairman and a founder of Silicon Valley Bank Capital's Fund of Funds uh, and Director of Funds. We've got $3 billion under management. Uh, we dropped a couple of podcasts this week as well. This is an interesting one. Uh, I imagine Malcolm might even find this one interesting. This is a report on Red Delta by Recorded Future, and uh, basically a Chinese APT compromising the Vatican and the Catholic Diocese of Hong Kong. And we also just released a podcast with Dr. Paolo Magni, who's the Deputy Dean for Murdoch University in Singapore on virtual crime scene investigations, and they have opened up a virtual center for simulation, uh, and they now simulate uh, crime scenes for training. Very interesting podcast. So that's pretty much it in terms of the news. We just wanted to follow up. So we cover space on My Security Media on our drasticnews.com website. There's a, a, a range of uh, space related articles that we publish mainly around the Australian market uh, and the trade between the US and Australia uh, and some of the research here, uh, particularly linking into this uh, Australian space agency. We did actually invite the Australian Space Agency to participate today, but uh, they weren't able to join us. Some news out this week also, the Trump's White House pushes measure to harden satellites against cyber threats. Uh, this was, I think, just over the weekend or on Friday. Uh, that is a new cybersecurity policy uh, for satellite security. And CLEOS was also an announcement in the last week. Uh, CLEOS Space has appointed Australian-based Spark systems as its territory agent for Australia. And hopefully if Glenn does join us, I went to a presentation with SES during the week. But um, what I wanted to do just before I hand over to the panel um, was just run through, this is obviously, the, this particular announcement here with CLEOS is linked to the uh, Indian Space Research Organization uh, and launching the CLEOS clusters uh, there. Focus is, uh, sort of their aim is to build up to 20 clusters of satellites. This is the second round uh, being launched up by the SpaceX Falcon 9 mid-2021. Um, and the presentation I went to late last week just outlined again from the audience perspective. And Glenn, welcome very much for joining us. Thank you, Glenn Tindell. Hello, sorry, I had problem. No, no, that's it, you've come in seamlessly. So this was a presentation uh, to a media group uh, late last week. And I thought just for the audience who might not be familiar with space technology and just to allow the panel to get as technical as you want. Um, but I thought this was a, a good couple of slides just on the geo, meo and leo aspects of the way satellites are working in terms of 
low Earth orbits, middle Earth orbits, and geosynchronous Earth orbits uh, and how they match. And I thought this was also a good slide just to explain uh, how these satellite sort of clusters and, and systems are looking to to work out. And obviously, we're seeing massive um, trends in the MEO and LEO uh, spaces. So hopefully for the uh, so hopefully for the panel that at least introduces the audience to some of the, the technical aspects of what you'll be talking about and welcome you to get as technical uh, and as policy driven as well uh, as you see fit. So on that note, the agenda, we're going to start with Dr. Subha Rayo uh, from Ananth Technologies, a leading Indian uh, space uh, company. And uh, Dr. Subha Rayo, I'm going to hand over to you. Then we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Malcolm Davis from, from ASPI. Then we'll hear from Yochi Kamiyama in Japan. And Yochi, I've got your slides that I'll run through with you. Uh, and Glenn, if you've got some slides available, that's fine. And I'll hand over to you when the time comes. It's very, I'll just prompt you over. But uh, we'll hear from Glenn as well. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Chris and um, for a good introduction and in fact i'm able to appreciate your programs more and more on seeing your presentation now i hope that will be the part of your system as you go along and also thanks to mr dr mclean davis and mr ochi kamai Elma, and mr glenn dindal mr raman sapori Pardon me if my pronunciation of your names could be <laughs> anything misspelled. Okay. Yeah. I would like to talk to you about the Indian space program, how it evolved over a period of time during the last 70 years, and now where we stand in terms of liberalization of the program that has been recently announced, and our company, Anant Technology Limited which has been working for the last 27 years into the space program and our contribution and what's the way forward. And broadly, these are the areas we would like to cover during my presentation. Even if I slip little time, I mean extra time, you should pardon me now. Uh, first, I'll speak to you about the Indian space program, which has been in existence for the last 70 years. The main theme of the program, which was government-run program all along, is to focus on the national development using the space technology. That's how we built the communication satellites and earth observation satellites and navigation satellites over a period of time. And all of them have been working work and working very well and meeting the most of the requirements of the country all along. And in the process, we developed two launch vehicles completely with indigenous support. And those two launch vehicles are namely PSLV, which is meant for, which is called a polar satellite launch vehicle, which normally we're using to push the satellites into LEO and MEO orbits. And also we developed the complete GSLV, solar satellite launch vehicle, which pushed the satellites to geosynchronous orbit. And basically, we are using it for communication satellites in this country. And I must tell you that all our satellites, the PSLV, etc., the the flawless, and they also attract the attention of the international community. And in fact, we launched a lot of satellites of the foreign companies too from India. And in this process, we built a large fleet of satellite uh, remote sensing satellites called IRS series. We call them Indian remote sensing satellites at different. Uh, uh, orbital positions and with the different re resolutions. And the communication satellites, a series we have is called Indian National Satellite Systems. And we have our own regional navigation systems called IRNSS. We built, we launched, and we have been effectively using them for Indian requirements and for, mostly for the communication side and also for Airports Authority of India. Besides this, we also built educational and the science and technology satellites. For example, a satellite by name Aditya is going to explore the possibilities of entire sun flares and its observation systems. And that's going to be shortly be launched. And we also successfully done 
two missions, or already of two missions for Chandrayana program, that's a moon mission, and at the low, lowest cost possible in the globe compared to any other company, any other nation, we could have a, a moon mission from India. And very successfully, we did that. And similarly, and the, we also attempted on the Chandrayana 2 and also Mars mission programs. And again, in the first attempt, we could succeed to reach the Mars orbit and also take the few photographs around that. And we've been working out very well on that. In total, we launched about 109 satellites so far and 77 launch vehicles and 10 student satellites, two re-entry missions and 319 satellites from 33 countries abroad. In fact, in one of the missions, our PSL will launch 104 satellites in one go. It's a record, that's a world, world record. And the two re-entry missions we did in order to have our own astronauts into the space and bring them back successfully we did a couple of experiments and we succeeded in that. And now, as we do this, as I told you earlier, the entire program is a government driven program in this country. Recently, the government of India announced a space policy which will enable us, uh, the Indian industry, not only to participate in the program along with ISRO, but also to be independent of that and we become co travelers in Indian space journey. So that's how you know, a level playing field is being created between the government agencies and also that of Indian industry, like what's happening in, in America and Europe and in Australia. And similarly, a, a, a policy regulatory environment is you know, being created. So that's how it, you know, it, it, uh, it enables us to be on equal play, level playing field with the government agencies in this country. And similarly, a lot of facilities have been built over a period of time in ISRO for testing and many other facilities. Those facilities are available for Indian industry too. And the future satellites, future projects like planetary exploration, outer space travel, etc., to be also to be open for the private sector. It is a great opportunity for companies like us in India and foreign companies to work together in order to explore the possibilities in this area and also liberal geospatial data policy. That means to you have the highest resolution of the satellites for the Earth observation that also can be built by the Indian industry and we can all work together into this area too. And in this process, the, the idea earlier was supply-based model that government has created, but now we are looking at demand-based model. So therefore, the lot of demand, since we are entering into digital economy all over, and in fact, the COVID has taught us many lessons in terms of the communications, in terms of need for the, this type of meetings to be held, or to be held only through the, you know, through the, uh, the satellites and related activities. So therefore, we are now getting into demand-based model. And in this respect, the India needs huge number of transponders today to reach the, the various nook and corners. And the data requirements are so huge. So therefore, the government has created an agency by name, New Space India Limited, and this company will provide as necessary support that is required from the government of India and ISRO Indian Space programs. And similarly, a lot of you know non-government entities like us, so we can take the necessary support, and they'll be going to be level playing field, which is going to be ensured by an agency called In Space. And that's how the entire uh, environment uh, ecosystem is being created, and this is fully opened up. And that's where we, we, the Indian companies and the foreign companies can work together in this area. And uh, the private participation, not only in the satellites programs, but also in the launch vehicle programs that can happen. Perhaps you fix some, we, we are companies like yours and ours can build a launch vehicle, which is uh, most cost effective, which can push the number of satellites into low Earth orbiting at most economical cost. I think there's an opportunity for us to work together. We have a port called Shreri Quota Port, which launches the satellites, and that port is also open for us. And we want to build a new facilities there for our own use. We can do so with the entire ecosystem being available in that area. And uh, that's about the space program, which has opened up, and you know things have been changed. The, the entire uh, the ecosystem in this country. And uh, I appeal to our other co-panelists 
to open up the opportunities of uh, available in this country to the rest of the world. And uh, as far as our company is concerned, I myself was working in the Indian space program earlier for long years, and uh, I started this company that deals again with the space program in this country. And we started in 1992 uh, with the mission of you know ensuring that private participation to the space industry. And we so far contributed to 82 satellites in India and 65 launch vehicles in creating a lot of system design development of systems and subsystems for our satellite programs and launch vehicle programs. Of course, we have more than 200 employees in the country across the five centers in India and we have the complete facilities that is required for building of the satellites in this country. And as I mentioned to you, uh, for both the PSLV and GSLV, we contributed for 65 launch vehicles and 82 satellites so far. That's a, a, a good amount of contribution from our company to the space program. And we have a, a facility for complete manufacturing, the fullest manufacturing of satellites in this country. We can build four large satellites of four tons each, simultaneously in our facility, which I'm showing it here. And also we can build nearly about 100, 150 small satellites. That's how the entire facility has been created. Subsystems, systems, integration, AIT, assembly, integration, and testing of the satellites entirely can be taken care of in this facility under one roof. And when it comes to uh, satellite programs, and we have been working on a lot of communication side, telemetry and telecommand systems, power management systems, altitude orbit control, in other words, on the communications, the controls, and the power related, and satellite integration, alignment, spacecraft related, very many areas we have been working together along with ISRO all along. And uh, so far, for every satellite in the country, the TMTC and the controls, the power systems, they're coming from us. And also the complete AIT part is now being established in the private sector, and we're going to be at it. And just to give an idea about a kind of a number of systems that have been contributed to various satellites in the country, I just they've been listed out here. But however, the point remains that the communications, then the controls, the sensors, the very many areas we contributed, and the power management for the satellites and uh, things like that. And there are some of the subsystems that we've been making for the satellite systems in the country. And there's something about the ground-related activities for the second satellites. And these are all the various fabrication, manufacturing, and testing facilities that we have completed in this country. And uh, for example, some of the systems which we need for building up the large satellites, we can always depend upon Indian Space Program facilities. They are also accessible to us besides what we have. And uh, you can look at the, you know, the kind of a complete assembly, integration, testing of the satellites. And this clearly shows the kind of a capability that Indian industry has built over a period of time. And the complete testing facility for satellites. Again, ground checkout, the monitoring, orbiting systems, completely end-to-end -end can be created here. And the solar panel deployment mechanisms, and the ground checkouts, alignment services, electrical integration, and whatnot. And similarly, for the launch vehicle programs, we have another facility in a place called Thiruvananthapuram. Uh, that's where, you know, Vikram Sarabhai Space Center is located, where the launch vehicles are being built. And they completely, you know, we have a lot of systems, subsystems, like avionics packages, initial navigation systems, and uh, harnessing of various states of PSLV and GSLV launch vehicles, sub-assembly integration, test and evolution, and environmental test facilities completely been built. They're available with us, and we have, we have in our own facility. And in that, we completely, you know, we, we contributed to 65 plus launch vehicles so far. It's a huge number. And, uh, and uh, the most challenging part of the integration of the entire launch vehicle, like a PSLV into one. And not only making subsystems, but integration of the various stages and ensuring that the launch is a successful, you know, the end-to-end -end kind of a thing, you know, which we, we take care of here. These are the various engines that, that goes along with that. And we also provide launch vehicle services, but not only subsystems, systems, integration, launch vehicle services completely from India. And as you know, the space program has three segments, satellite, launch vehicle, and also the geospatial services and a lot of applications. And we contribute immensely 
in this area for land topography we call them water sources land and soil mechanics you know very many areas and jas we do a lot of things in this area in this country that's you know we have, there's a lot of opportunities in this country and uh, i think you know the way forward there's going to be for all of us to understand and appreciate and to participate in the future programs of in india is that you know where india has 1.3 billion population and the bandwidth requirement is so huge for this 1.3 billion population and they have been spread in the entire country the deep into the himalayas or into the sea coast or into the deserts areas into a lot of, lot of areas and spread it you know you know the india itself is a, a, a subcontinent by itself so huge requirements of bandwidth for this and further we are moving into digital economy all over the globe so that's where you know demand is so high and since the continent is a big one and also can address the global requirements we can build a lot of observation satellites from india and the space policy also allows 100 percent the foreign fda into this country and that's how we can build the necessary collaborations or joint ventures allowing the rest of the country which can be used for the india and also for the global economy thank you very much thank you very much dr um i've taken the liberty so the audience can download the ananth brochure uh from the system as well so Raman, you'd send that through to me so there's a couple of brochures there uh and same with eos uh glenn just to give a sense of your company uh just off your website there's a brochure there to download uh, on one of your systems as well, just uh, uh, yep. just to give you yeah, the audience a bit of background. And I apologise, uh, Dr. Severeo, I did have your profile up on the on the screen, but you've covered it, so thank you very much. There's a couple of questions from the audience. I'm going to hand it straight over to Malcolm, but uh, we'll come back to these questions, uh, Doctor. One is, what's the program looking like going forward? And then there was another question on the hypersonic cruise missile. Uh, is that likely to give a boost to the space program in India? And the question was also going to be, uh, have you got much involvement in that? So I'll kind of put you on notice with those questions. We'll move on to Malcolm Davis and we'll come back to, because I'm imagining some of the, the questions might be answered along the way in terms of uh, the regional aspect of space uh, and then some of these questions. So just letting the audience know, keep your questions coming in, we will cover them off. So Malcolm, um, Based on that, we've got Dr. Sabura Rayo there in India showing quite a, you know, almost uh, 30 years experience in space in India as well. Uh, I know you're covering off a lot more current aspects of space as well. Um, yeah, welcome your insights in terms of some of the work that you've been doing uh, for the region as well in this space domain. Okay, uh, so essentially, uh, let me talk a bit about what I do at ASPE, what ASPE is, and it's not so much focused very much on particular commercial systems or commercial projects. We don't build hardware. Uh, ASPE is a think tank uh, in terms of uh, providing alternative defence and national security advice to government. And my role at ASPE has been to focus very much on space security and space policy uh, at ASPE in terms of providing that advice uh, on where Australia is going in space in the defence and national security context, but also looking at the commercial sector in terms of uh, where Australia is going in space commercially. So let me go through so this presentation. This is actually a presentation that I'm uh, giving next week in Maui, virtually, um, <laughs> at 3.30 in the morning Canberra time on uh, Australian space policy. And uh, so it'll give you an idea of, of, of where things are headed. I think the key messages that I want to get across is that in recent years, there's been a, a, a significant shift in Australia's thinking on the importance of the space domain. And this has really come to the fore most recently with the release of the um, 2020 uh, Defence Strategic Update and Force Structure Plan, which really elevates the importance of space as, as a key domain of operations going forward and has seen increasing funding for space capability compared to previous defence white papers. Space is now seen as uh, to be of rising importance uh, and space domain awareness, space surveillance is a vital task for the ADF uh, and for the Department of Defence as part of the Five Eyes. But we're moving beyond just space domain awareness and space surveillance, we're looking at how we do space resilience. And so there the Australian commercial space sector is really coming to the fore. And our potential to produce small sats and CubeSat constellations 
and to potentially launch them on um, on our own sovereign launch capabilities, I think really adds to our ability to work with partners, not only in the Five Eyes, but also other partners such as the Quad, uh, to be able to do uh, cooperate in space uh, and respond to challenges there. We're dependent on space in many respects. Um, we can't fight as a, as a as a military without space capabilities to underpin our joint and integrated um, uh, information-based operations and to gain and sustain a knowledge edge in war. If we, if we don't have space, we're deaf, dumb and blind. But more broadly for our society, uh, we require space capabilities uh, that, that to underpin our information-based economies. If we don't have space capabilities, then an awful lot of our society falls apart. Taking it to another level in terms of how we fight war, um, space is vital for fighting a Western way of war that's fast, precise and low cost rather than uh, sort of a prolonged meat grinder of, of attritional warfare. And we want to be able to fight war in a manner that's consistent with laws of armed conflict and just in bellow, uh, that, that emphasizes distinction and discrimination, military necessity and proportionality. And space is critical for all of that. And as General William Shelton, the US commander of Spacecom in 2015 said, to lose space capabilities would almost be a reversion back to industrial base warfare. And the challenge is going forward in space, space is not a sanctuary. Uh, it's not this peaceful environment that is free of military conflict. It's contested in every sense of the word. Um, it's a global commons, but like the sea and like cyberspace and like air, it's a domain of conflict and competition. And that trend is only going to increase in the future. It's certainly not a sanctuary that sits uh, serene and untouched by ge geopolitical rivalry below. So as Australia thinks about its next steps in space in terms of our space capability development and our space policy, we're doing this through the lens of recognising that our space capabilities may be challenged by adversaries out there that are developing their own counter space capabilities. Space has been militarised since the 1960s, but there is a risk now that it is becoming weaponised. We certainly recognise that space is a centre of gravity for modern information-based armed forces, and in that sense, it's a key target for our adversaries. If they can take out our space capabilities, then they uh, severely undermine our ability to, to, to fight major war. And we are seeing evidence of major power actors pursuing counter space capabilities, uh, direct ascent anti-satellite weapons, co-orbital counter space capabilities, ground-based soft fuel capabilities that are designed to deny their opponents access to space uh, during wartime. So as I indicated at the beginning of this presentation, um, in July of this year, the government released the 2020 Defence Strategic Update and the Force Structure Plan. Uh, these are the latest uh, formal policy documents from the Australian government on defence policy. And one of the key things that leapt out of those documents was the elevated importance of the space domain as an operational domain in its own right. No longer seen merely as an adjunct for terrestrial forces, but an operational domain in its own right and thus requiring additional funding uh, and investment. Um, we also have other document, documents there. Uh, we have doctrine documents, uh, which some of which I've listed there on that uh, slide. Um, but what's missing at the moment is an unclassified defense space strategy document. The Americans have just released uh, their own equivalent of this. We have yet to go down that path. And I think that there's an urgent need for a space, strat a space uh, strategy document as part of a space power debate in defence as well as organisational reform and a change in how we staff space. So rather than having people coming in and out of various different programs and staying in space for 18 months then leaving, we need to have a professional cadre of space professionals whose career is space. And in that sense, we need to move and follow in the footsteps of the Americans and the British and the Japanese who are going down the path of formalised space forces of one form or another. The 2020 uh, Defence Strategic Update and the Force Structure um, Plan, as I said, elevated the prominence of space, but essentially it restated many of the 2016 white paper policy decisions. So we saw increased investment in space, up to $7 billion Australian to 2030. But these are largely invested in large satellite programs that have already been allocated. So uh, Sovereign SATCOM, which is JP9102B, 
and space-based intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, which is DEF 799 phase two. These, these projects have been underway for some years. And now really the, the latest documents really re restate the importance of these. We're also looking at assuring precision, uh, positioning, navigation and timing in a contested environment because we recognize the challenge uh, that can counter space capabilities could do to us having uh, GPS type services. Um, we want to be able to boost uh, uh, allied burden sharing and orbit. Uh, we're part of the Combined Space Operations Initiative, which was established in 2014, CSPO. Um, we work with the Australian Space Agency and the commercial space sector to be able to develop capabilities in the future. And I think that one of the key things that came out of these documents was a greater focus on space control for the Australian Defence Force in the future. We recognise that we have to start taking that seriously. Uh, and there's a quote there which I won't read through in whole, but um, Chris, if you have my slides, or if you, I'll send, I've sent you my slides, so you can have that on your website. Um, essentially, what it says is that government now recognises that space is really important. We have to invest more in it. We have to take it more seriously. Work with our partners uh, to do more things in space than just have a ground-based space program. Um, so this is extending across to other agencies, um, the Australian Space Agency, which was established in July of 2018, uh, now has its civil national space strategy, uh, which establishes a series of priorities for investment. 2020 Defence Science and Technology Organisation has released its own uh, space, its own strategy, which includes science, technology and research goals, or star shots, as they call them one of which is a resilient multi-mission space. Engagement with the commercial sector is expanding rapidly. Uh, you know, really, Australia is a rapidly growing area in terms of commercial space activities. It's one of the fastest growing markets in the world for commercial space. Um, people from other countries come to this country and say, look, there's a real buzz in terms of where Australia is going as a commercial space partner. And so you're seeing government engage with the commercial um, uh, sector for major projects like DEF 799 Phase 2 and JP9102, and also to open up new space capability options. And one of those, for example, could be sovereign space launch from Australia. You're seeing the establishment of three potential launch sites, a number of companies that are building launch capabilities. So within the next few years, I would expect to see Australian launch vehicles launching Australian satellites uh, from Australian launch sites. And I think that's a very exciting prospect. One of the key trends in all of this is a space 2.0 approach. Um, we are not going down the path of a government run space sector. Uh, although the space agency is a government agency, its job is to stimulate and grow the commercial space sector and let the commercial space sector lead rather than have a taxpayer funded end-to-end -end space program where the government agency is building satellites and rockets, flying the missions and, and controlling them. So really the focus is very much on a space 2.0 approach uh, and we're looking at how high-low mixes can play a role in our space architecture rather than having everything sourced from overseas, we can build um, capabilities locally and launch them locally. But as I said, what's missing at the moment, uh, I think a big issue of contention within the Australian space sector is an explicit commitment from the Australian Defence Force uh, and Defence to support sovereign launch capability. I believe that will come, um, but at the moment, government is very much hung up on debates over regulation uh, and how we ensure that space launch is safe and profitable. Uh, and I think that the Australian commercial space sector is raring to go and is probably racing ahead and, and is getting quite frustrated about how slow government is going on this. Um, I think space domain awareness is going to be a critical role for Australia given our geographic location in the southern hemisphere, a large land mass, most of which is unpopulated, so we can establish um, uh, space, space domain awareness sensors. These are the um, uh, C-band radar and the Space Surveillance Telescope, which is based at Exmouth in Western Australia. They're run by the US as part of the US Deep Space Surveillance System. Uh, but Australia is also expanding the commercial side of things uh, to be able to have complement these capabilities with commercial, both ground-based and space-based space domain awareness capabilities. So the broad message there is Space is no longer merely an adjunct to terrestrial um, domains. It's an operational domain in its own right. It's contested 
congested and competitive, and we have to uh, operate within that, that context of what space is. Space domain awareness is, is vital in this, this aspect, but I believe it's only one aspect of where we're going in this country of space, and you're seeing other approaches uh, in the commercial sector that are growing that could open up new roles for us. Um, you're seeing, in terms of the, the, the commercial space domain awareness side of things, you're seeing a number of companies that are doing a range of projects, including space-based space surveillance with their own satellites that they're building. Um, and we were ex well exploited to, to exploit space 2.0 technologies and second mover advantage to pursue breakthroughs in this area so that Australia could become a leading player in space domain awareness to not only in support of our own needs and also those of the US, but also to support other key allies within the Five Eyes and also potentially beyond to the quad as well. Space resilience, I think, is the next big step for Australia. Uh, we talk about resilient multi-mission space. We talk about space control. How do we deal with counter space systems in a contested space domain? Well, the answer clearly is space resilience. How do we maintain resilient space support capabilities in the face of growing counter space threats? One of the ways we can do that is through augmentation of space capabilities. So rather than investing in a small number of very high cost large satellites, we have large numbers of small satellites or fractionated constellations of CubeSats that are much more difficult for an adversary to take out. Uh, so augmentation is one thing, reconstitution is the next step, whereby we can have the ability to rapidly deploy our own satellites on our own launch vehicles from Australia to rapidly reconstitute satellite constellations in the event of a space uh, of a threat from a space uh, counter space adversary. But that demands we go forward with, with sovereign launch, and I think that's where we're stuck at at the moment, is getting government on board to support that. Um, and we have the potential, as I said, with three launch sites in the works, uh, one up in the Northern Territory uh, for equatorial LEO missions, uh, one in South Australia for polar orbit missions, and one proposed in, on the Eastern Seaboard near Bowen in Queensland, um, for having a, vi a vibrant and growing space launch capability that could also exploit fourth industrial revolution um, production of not, not only launch vehicles, but payloads. So Australian satellites launched on Australian launch vehicles from Australian launch sites has to be the future, in my opinion, but government has to get behind that. And there's the locations of the, of the two approved launch sites, the one up here in near Nullumbi and near Gove, and then down here at Whalers Way in South Australia, and there's a third one here on the coast near Townsville that, that the people are talking about. And I'm happy to finish there, and I'm happy to take any questions from your, your listeners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Very interesting, and you just answered one of my questions at the end there. Um, the other thing I think uh, is worth mining, I'm not too sure where India sits with this, is the West Australian sort of mining industries, their remote mining, I think, is very exciting when you look sort of 30 years from now uh, with what they plan to do on Mars as well. Uh, so Australia is well set. It's going to be a long, long road. Um, we'll hold questions now. I did have a couple there uh, for you. Uh, Yochi, if you're ready to go, I'm going to just get your uh, presentation up one moment. Okay. Uh, first of all, that, uh, thank you very much for the uh, inviting uh, this opportunity. So I'm very appreciative, and uh, thank you, Chris. And uh, again, my name is Yoichi Kamiyama, uh, policy researcher at the Japan Institute for the Space and the Security. We call JISS. Uh, JISS is a Japanese think tank led by Mr. Morimoto who is ex-minister of uh, Ministry, Ministry of Defense and established in uh, three years ago, 2018, and to promote, to propose a space security policy for government, ministries, and uh, industries. And also let me a little bit, uh, you know, introduce myself. Uh, I work for JISS uh, as a policy researcher and also work for uh, the Remote Sensing Center for Japan, WESTEC, as the uh, executive managing director. The before joining a JISS and the WESTEC, I have worked for 
Mitsubishi Corporation, which is a Japanese uh, big trading company, in around uh, 40 years, where I have been heavily involved in the space business, covering whole range of space, like uh, national security, civil, and the commercial business as well. Today, uh, I would like to share with you about Japanese space policy and my you know, hypothetical strategic scenario along with the current national security situation in Japan. First of all, let's just take a look at the Japanese space market. So next chart, please. Um, please look at the bar graph at the upper left, uh, which is uh, uh, shows you a Japanese space budget. Uh, and the uh, size of the budget is about, uh, let's say, 3.4 billion US dollar, which is remaining flat in the last 10 years. And the pie, pie chart at the upper right shows you the space budget size for each ministry in 2020. Um, more than 50% is occupied by MEXT, which is the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sport, Science, Technology, which is very you know, mixed up ministry though, but who manage the uh, JAXA uh, budget, uh, which include H, H2, H3 launch vehicle, uh, observation satellite, and uh, in international space station related uh, budget as well. And the second biggest is for cabinet secretaries, who owns IGS, which stands for information gathering satellite. The third one is for cabinet office, who is in charge of uh, QZSS, quasi Zenith satellite system, which is a Japanese version of uh, you know, navigation satellite. And the uh, fourth one is the uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, who use the commercial military satellite communication as well as commercial uh, satellite measuring. In the meantime, the uh, if you look at the uh, bottom in the pyramid chart showing the Japanese space market size, you can understand that the size of space system market on the top pyramid is about the same as the Japanese government space budget, which is about 3.5 billion US dollars. At the bottom, at the bottom, you know, space service market is for satellite communication broadcasting and uh, GPS you know, equipment. We can understand that there is no leverage between the space system and the space service market. Okay, um, let me show you the history of the Japanese space policy with the next chart. Next chart, please. Um, Japanese space development started in the late uh, 1950s by independent development, namely domestic you know, development. However, when Japan entered into the full-scale space development by establishment, uh, establishing a NASDA, which is a former you know, JAXA uh, back in uh, 1969, Japan changed its policy to get uh, technology transfer from the United States from a domestic development. And also, uh, Japan made a diet resolution, so-called PPO, which stands for Peace on a Purpose Only, which means that the Japan would never use the space for the purpose other than the peaceful purpose. By this PPO, uh, it was prohibited for Japan to own military satellite. However, in 1998, triggered by Tepodon missile launch from North, North Korea, Japan uh, decided to develop uh, IGS. Even this you know, satellite was reconnaissance satellite. However, it named as uh, information gathering satellite because of uh, this you know, PPO. This PPO policy continued until 2008, when space basic law was legislated. Space basic law constitutes to promote 
national security, industrialization, and science technology in space. And interpretation of a PPO was changed to non aggression from non military. So now that Japan can own a military satellite as far well as non aggregation satellite concerned, we call, you know, 40 years between 1996 and 2008 as the lost four decades in space. While space basic law was legislated, Japanese space security has not so been progressed. As economic recovery policy was higher issue right after the Lehman shock in 2008. However, national security environment surrounding Japan has been changing now. Threat of China became evident risk from potential risk, along with US, China, Cold, new Cold War. So let's talk about hypothetical, you know, strategic scenario, how we can collaborate in Indo-Asia Pacific countries. Next chart, please. I don't think I have to explain in detail how serious China threat is. Belt and Road Initiative, growing presence in the East and the South China Sea, trying to be a military and economy giant competing with the United States. China uh, increased the space power in PMT, reconnaissance, anti-satellite system, German satellite, even lunar and Mars exploration. I think uh, China threat for Japan should be a common threat for the Indo-Asia and Pacific countries. Very recently, the uh, USDOD released Defense Space Strategy, June 2020, describing uh, you know, co cooperate with the allies and the industry as one of our strategic approaches. Um, I think it is important for each country to establish one space security strategy zone. And uh, I think there are many areas or uh, operations in collaborating among Japan, Australia, India, and other Indo -Asia, uh, Asian countries who can share the common value, which is important, such as the freedom, democracy, this, uh, respect of fundamental human right and rule of law. The potential, you know, collaboration area could be SSA or uh, space domain awareness, STM or maritime domain awareness, and even a uh, space exploration. I think we should collaborate in the development and operation by leveraging the respective strengths and the interest of each country. And next chart, please. Next chart, yeah. Now this is a summary. Um, Japan space market relies on the government budget, and it's because of a Japanese space, you know, politics histories. After you know, lost four decades in space, Japan is moving forward on space in terms of national security industries and science technology. Realizing China threat along with US-China Cold War, Japan should move quickly in developing a national security, space security strategy and partnership with the commercial space industries and also alliance with US and other allies. MDA, SDA, SDA, or those you know, think could be one of the practical approach in Australia, India, Japan uh, partnership. Common thing is that uh, we had a lot of uh, internal discussion within Japan, probably you know, small satellite constellation platform can be applied for the you know, global system such as MDA, SDA, even even uh, missile warning or whatever. As far as uh, you know, 
small satellite constellation is collaboration with many, you know, like could be uh, better and uh, cheaper. That is my, you know, uh, hypothetical scenario. Thank you very much. This is all my uh, presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yochi. Um, and it's good to see that yep. collaboration uh, wanted there. Let me just get back to the main slide. Glenn, you've got a slide deck as well, correct? I do. Right. Uh, and it's good to see Malcolm mentioning EOS there. Let me hand over to you now. All right. Well, um, thank you, everybody. Um, look, I've, over the last decade, I've had the good fortune to visit everyone's countries uh, here. Um, I've been doing a lot of talking to uh, uh, governments about their needs uh, in space communication in particular. So what I'm going to talk about today is, first, I'll give an overview of who is EOS because nobody knows who we are. Um, secondly, I wanted to, the, the, for the bulk of the time, I want to talk about the main themes, the takeaways that I'm hearing from all of the various governments. And finally, I'll close with just a short description of um, what, what we are doing at EOS in this domain. So first of all, so here's a short agenda, uh, which I just described. So EOS, um, so we've been around for about 35 years. Uh, we are actually Australia's largest homegrown defense company. Um, so we are not specifically a satellite company, but more focused on uh, defense applications. Um, where our heritage came from is uh, basic physics research, um, in particular, uh, the use of laser technology, ground-based laser technology for doing uh, uh, very precise tracking of objects in space. Um, actually, as a business, about 90% of our uh, revenues come from overseas. Um, mostly we are exporting to other countries around the world and, and not really not so much within Australia. Uh, within the business, we have three sectors. So the original uh, sector was one we call space, and fundamentally that is uh, what we would today call space domain awareness. Uh, tracking objects in uh, LEO, MEO, GEO, and, and further out orbits. Uh, we operate a number of um, uh, laser-based telescope facilities in Australia and overseas, and we, we, are, we are the ones that generate a lot of these databases of um, space debris and other objects. Uh, we calculate the ephemeris, uh, additionally, we locate the uh, things like the GPS satellites in space so that uh, the timing, once you know where they are in space, then the timing uh, can be uh, conducted to make GPS work. Uh, following the success of that uh, business and, and that continuing business, we developed a defense business, a again, using the same laser uh, technology for uh, tracking and identifying targets for um, gun platforms. And so we uh, built we build a range of remote weapon stations, which we uh, sell all over the world and are the world leader in developing that technology. And more recently, we have branched into a communications uh, business, which largely means satellite communications. Um, what what if you think about it? These these three business uh, th these three businesses support one another. Um, in, in order to do anything in space, first of all, you need to know what's going on there. So that situational awareness is the fundamental um, uh, part of the business, that that's what enables us to do everything else. Uh, I talked about remote weapon stations, gun platforms. So that's sort of the shooter end. But And then the communication system ties it all together to allow information exchange within, within uh, a government uh, users uh, network and, and also with allies and partners. So these are mutually self-supporting pieces of business. Uh, just a bit of a potted timeline there. You can see that earlier on in the 80s, we were very focused on um, uh, optical systems. And you can see uh, interactions with uh, a Japanese research, communications research laboratory and others. Um, whereas if you look to the right of the chart, you would see more activity happening in the, in the space uh, communications area, and which, which I'm uh, working in. Right, 
so so as I said, having having this background and having worked across uh, many different uh, nations uh, in, around the world, I've identified a number of themes which are current and are currently being discussed by uh, government agencies everywhere. And I'd just like to talk about those and share those with you. So uh, fundamentally, the, the first one I see is uh, situational awareness. So I touched on this already, that um, in order to do anything in space, you first have to know what is the environment, what's going on and what's happening. And, and th this is crucial uh, in, in all parts of the world. And this is why we also need cooperation between friendly nations in order to share this type of information and, and share a common operating picture. Um, once, once you have uh, assets in, uh, deployed in the field for military or other purposes, um, we need to have a large amount of bandwidth there. Uh, the bandwidth is really for two reasons. One is for command and control, which is relatively smaller, but actually what's really driving the bandwidth these days is uh, ISR needs. So intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, um, uh, radars, um, video imagery and other things need to be brought back from an asset in the field back to a central environment where it can be um, processed and turned into an intelligence product and then it can be pushed back out into the field for the users. Um, as we're all aware, there are cameras everywhere, even in space today, and so the demand for bandwidth is just increasing exponentially. The next trend I see is ubiquity. Um, so we don't just want communications available on a ship or on an airplane, we want it everywhere. We want it in space, we want it deployed. So modern uh, satellite communication systems really need to look at being able to deliver bandwidth uh, everywhere a user may require it. Uh, immediacy. So ha having information, about, uh, receiving information which is minutes or hours old is not as useful as in real time. Um, you know, what, if, if a small LEO satellite is uh, whizzing around the Earth taking uh, imagery, normally you would wait about an hour and a half for it to clock around the Earth and uh, be available to be downlinked. Um, of course, this data would be much more uh, useful and uh, valuable if, if it was available in real time. And so we see, we see a demand for this type of real time uh, data everywhere. Uh, no one needs to uh, discuss uh, cyber security uh, more, more heavily than we are today because uh, we see a, a very strong focus on cyber security um, in, in every sense. Um, in many countries around the world, the governments are creating a cyber command within within the armed forces, um, and, and uh, this is really due to the very strong pressure we're seeing uh, and the attacks from uh, the, the cyber adversaries. Uh, I've also covered off LPI, LPD here. So this is low pro probability of intercept, low probability of de detection. So with it, with a typically with a satellite communication service, a beam is focused upon the Earth. And the beam is quite large. It may be uh, hundreds or thousands of kilometres across. And so, of course, this means that if your adversary is, is relatively close to you, he can jam your communications. Um, if you think about electro-optic systems as having strong capabilities in uh, optical technology, uh, it's a very different situation with optical communications, where instead of having a, a beam which is tens or hundreds of kilometres across, typically uh, optical beams are very narrow maybe only 10 or hundreds of meters across. So that means if you can stand off from your adversary um, by a few kilometers, he can't jam you. And you can imagine how many applications there are in government for, for such a thing. Uh, last but not least, resilience. Um, it's no good having a network if it's not there when you need it. Um, so uh, governments all around the region are putting a lot of thought into how to create networks which are not simply destroyed upon the, 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 the first, um, uh, the, the, the commencement of conflict, but are somehow survivable and robust and, uh, or, or can be defended. And uh, so these are, these are, so in summary, these are the themes that I see uh, around the world. And what does this really also mean? It also means sovereignty and self-reliance. So uh, as, as, as uh, was Malcolm was saying earlier, um, there is a strong focus these days on governments, not wanting to cooperate with our partners, but not needing to, but r rather wanting to be able to have a self-determination and a sovereign um, uh, capability. And certainly we see that's the case very strongly in Australia.
So what's EOS doing about it? Um, I'll just talk about one program which I think is very exciting and perhaps illustrates some of the uh, uh, the way illustrates the way that we've addressed some of those criteria. Uh, we call this program SpaceLink, um, and what it is is a space data relay system. So a space data relay system is a satellite, a small satellite constellation that is designed to move traffic from LEO satellites or other or satellites in other orbits across the relay system and down into a gateway. Um, and the classical example would be, let's suppose a government has an Earth observation satellite that's whizzing around the Earth, um, uh, and, but it, maybe it's on the other side of the Earth. So you'd, you want to have that data immediately available, continuously available. You don't want to land it in a foreign country and then have to bring it via fibre back to your home territory. What you would really like is the data moves continuously from this small sensor via a, a space-based uh, relay network and then comes down into your own into your own territory um, so in so this, this is the constellation that we are currently building uh, so uh, in last year uh, EOS acquired uh, some sub, some uh, filings to build such a satellite system uh, the filings are in a in a mid-earth orbit and uh, th there's a very large amount of uh, frequencies uh, associated with this spectrum which will enable us to build um, you know, well in excess of 100 gigabits of capacity. So, so it's, to our mind, thinking back to those themes that I spoke about earlier, this uh, addresses many, if not all, of those themes. And that's, that's what we'd like to uh, provide towards um, the Australian and partner governments going forward. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Glenn. That was great. Um, and as I mentioned, you are previously with SES as well. You spent 17 years with uh, SES, and I had some couple of their slides up earlier. Uh, so hopefully uh, we can have them on into the future with their project, particularly with PNG and the communications satellite project that they're working on. Um, just a couple of questions. I think you've, Glenn has touched on that, and maybe back to Dr. Suva Rayo is, what is your program looking like uh, sort of out to 2024? Um, getting busier or pretty much steady as, as she goes? Yeah, so we have a very busy program. In the light of uh, the reforms announced in the Indian space sector and the needs that uh, the India has, the huge requirements, in fact, as Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Glenn has mentioned, there is a need to have low Earth orbiting satellites with the 100 GPPS connectivity to be provided to 1.3 billion population in this country. This we are talking about just for, as a re revolution of digital technology alone in this country. And if we add the requirements of the, the commercial and shipping, navigation, and many other areas, this could be huge. I think uh, what Mr. Glynn has mentioned about is a collaborative attempt, perhaps can be extended to the Indian subcontinent too. And similarly, Mr. Merklam Davis has mentioned about the strategy in order to have the, the international collaborations to expand the program further. Perhaps that's what we need to look at it. I think this forum should address, and as far as we are concerned, we look forward to work with all of you in this area. And please keep in mind the Indian market is so huge compared to Europe or in America or even Australian market. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one other question was the hypersonic cruise missile project. Uh, I don't know whether you'd even be able to mention if you're involved with that. Do you think that's going to assist the Indian space program? Well, I don't want to comment on that now. Fair call. I didn't think you would. The, um, the last one, well, sorry, there's a question here from the audience. Will EOS share that presentation, Glenn? 
Uh, yes, I will. Uh, I'll send it through to you, Chris. Yeah. Great. And uh, Malcolm, you're okay to share your presentation also? Yes, that's fine. Great. Um, maybe back to Malcolm and again from uh, the Australian perspective, when we talk about sovereignty, Glenn's kind of pointing out to 2024, that's still sort of four years away, which is quite some time. Is that the type of time frame that we would expect uh, before we see some launches off Australian soil? Look, I think it largely depends on the government's willingness to move on space regulation. At the moment, you have companies on the Gold Coast like Gilmore Space Technology and also in Queensland, Black Sky, um, that are developing launch capabilities with Gilmore, suggesting that their Eris launch vehicle that is an orbital class launch vehicle could be ready to launch perhaps by 2022. Um, I think it will really depend on how quickly the government can move on this regulatory issue. Um, and uh, I think that the government really needs to understand that if they don't, um, deregulate sufficiently or if they try to impose too many uh, regulatory restrictions, they're going to kill the launch sector in this country before it even gets off the ground. Um, and then we're stuck, we're depending on others to launch our satellites and, and at that point we're not sovereign. So um, I think that whilst I'm not suggesting we should be completely autarkic and everything is done locally, I do think we need to have the capability to launch our own satellites when needed to support either the ADF or to support allies. Um, and the sort of things that Glenn was talking about with EOS, um, I think is a classic example of that. Um, and what I was talking about in terms of resilience and augmentation, uh, if we're really going to take advantage of the, of the rapid innovation curve that's associated with Space 2.0 and new space, where we can rapidly upgrade constellations on a month by month or year by year basis, um, then having that sovereign launch capability is really important. So I, I think 2024 is a reasonable date uh, for a space launch, providing government essentially gets its act together and starts moving forward. Um, Roman, maybe over to you, because uh, it was encouraging to see Yochi talking about collaboration. Uh, there's a, a delicate balance between collaborating with regional partners and then having pure sovereignty, particularly in a supply chain uh, as diverse as space. Where do you see potential opportunities here? Um, before uh, indicating uh, individual application, but I think it is important for all countries to sit down uh, in terms of uh, government level to share that uh, vision of uh, national securities in the uh, Asian Pacific area. And uh, that is a kind of, uh, you know, a goal where you have to you know, reach in the future. And then uh, we can, you know, discuss how to, you know, implement to deal with the, uh, you know, those national security issues. Together with the uh, government and the industries, the discussion have to be made. So that kind of uh, process is uh, important not just uh, talking about, uh, you know, each module like a launch vehicle, uh, satellite, uh, and so forth. I think the most important thing is share the common vision within the countries. And then uh, we can sit down, you know, how to make it. I think, uh, Roman, I might come over to you shortly, but I, one other observation I made during this presentation was, and maybe Dr. Saban Rao might be able to help, does, Indian ha does India have a, national space strategy that it has published because it's interesting Malcolm and Yochi have mentioned uh, a, a need for these countries to have a, a, a space strategy and I also noted it, it, it sounds very similar to cyber security sort of five years ago uh, that these discussions with space the importance the emerging rapid importance of cyber security we have a cyber security strategy and then we have to have a second strategy to reach out to partners. Where does India's cyber security, sorry, where does India's space strategy fit? Do you have one? Yeah. <clears throat> See, the, uh, the earlier Indian strategy was work only for India and with the government funding and the government agency. Now, the common vision, what do Japan has, in fact, we have a small association with the Japanese JAXA, so we have a program along with them, government to government program. 
and now this kind of programs no, no. can be extended to the private sectors too like in the communication sector right now where there are a lot of collaborative programs across the globe even this sector has been opened up there's a global vision under their global needs that can be addressed together in this regard fair enough Roman, maybe some closing comments from you and uh, there's a couple of other questions just while uh, welcome your comments but uh, I'll just read through, through yeah. some questions as you make, make those comments thank you Chris uh, this has been a wonderful discussion of sharing of thoughts I have two three points given the you know inputs from various panelists and presentations uh, the time uh, we could not do much justice but I am just visualizing the space demand and the market visualization for the policy which are in place uh, i would request all the panelists to suggest how do we see the skill sector build up the shortage going to come in the next uh, five to seven years i don't think we have enough human resource to match the demand for the uh, you know research development and uh, technologies because as the private sector moves we have to keep the cost low we have to keep the research development going and the funding if we spend so much time on the funding for education how will you see the you know economic viability of the projects so i would request all the panelists to see that a uh, couple of keywords which you have seen today is on the laser from mr glenn the collaboration of uh, the chinese threat the cyber security so there's a thin line between where we want to go the space command has also been discussed so i would say the key word would be collaboration 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 to keep the cost low and uh, that mm -hmm. is the way the will go i would request panelists to share how they see the requirement of manpower developing in the next five mm -hmm. to seven years over to you chris and to panelists yeah, I, might, if I might welcome uh, i think glenn i think would be good in terms of how do you find the australian market for skills uh, yep. and then I might come back to Malcolm if that's been recognised as a, a threat to the industry. Yeah. So, so in the space industry, sometimes we joke that everybody has grey hair or no hair. And, uh, <laughs> and this has been a bit of a problem for us in the past. So I think it's uh, the age profile of our industry is, uh, the established industry is a bit old. And so I think some of the things the Australian government is doing with the space agency in terms of STEM outreach encouraging uh, uh, students to study space and physics and associated technologies is very important. And I also think it's important for each of us in senior, senior leadership roles to make room in our organizations to bring in uh, younger uh, talent and give them opportunities within the organizations. Um, it, a long time, you know, many years ago, space was very boring and now it's very exciting. So it's a very good time to be approaching uh, and, and attracting this young talent. Yeah, definitely a strong link with cyber security there. I think there's a lot of opportunity for the sector. Malcolm, in your research, where do you see skills sitting for Australia? It's a very small population. We're struggling with cyber security skill sets as it is. Uh, space skill sets uh, must be a challenge for Australia. Well, I mean, a few years ago before we set up the space agency, um, anyone who wanted a, a job in space really, apart from maybe at EOS, uh, anyone who wanted a job in space had to go overseas uh, to get work. Uh, and that was a tragedy in my opinion. Um, and I think that we've moved past that. You're now starting to see an explosion in the growth of the commercial space sector right across the nation. It's concentrated in South Australia, but really it's right across the nation. But I think that we need to keep that momentum going. Uh, we need to get runs on the board quickly in terms of visible achievements, whether it's satellites launched or whether it's a, a sovereign launch capability or whether it's new types of ground segment um, applications for space that are, uh, are interesting and, and fascinating. We need to inspire. And I think that um, the worst thing we could do would be to fall back on where we were 10 years ago, where all we had was a ground-based um, space program, uh, where we were a passive user of space, but we were not an active provider of space. Uh, and I think we're heading in the right direction with new space. And I think that also we need to plug into US and other friendly um, space exploration activities like Project Artemis coming out of NASA, 
Um, that's really inspiring. Uh, you know, people often ask me, um, do you think we should have Australian astronauts? Uh, my answer is yes, what I would like to see would be an Australian standing on the lunar surface in the late 2020s with an Australian flag on his or her <laughs> space suit, because that would be inspiring to the nation. And I think that once again, this is a government need to get in, in sync with the national mood. There's a, there's a risk aversion in government, which I think is frustrating. The commercial sector is booming ahead. Uh, and I think young people are excited about space. Um, so let me finish up uh, with one point. Anthony Murphy, the Deputy Director of the Australian Space Agency, and I quote him all the time, he says, there are two cool things in life, space and dinosaurs. And I think we, we can really promote space. Yeah, uh, and Dr. Uh, Subarayo, maybe your comments on how do you find uh, sort of skill sets? You've been in the industry for some time yeah. as well. Um, the skill sets and also the opportunity for collaboration. I mean, education and cross skill experience must be, you know, at least an opportunity for collaboration between countries as we discussed here today. Yeah, I would like to divide my answer into two segments. Number one, as you know, the space has not one specialization. It has electronics, mechanical, structural engineering, metallurgy, plastics, you have many, many. Fortunately in India, the number of engineering colleges you have is very, very many. And our Indian students are very keen to get into engineering classes and their graduations also very many in that. But one problem that we have is, to retrain them for, for space requirements. There are no doubt electronic engineers on their own. They can be working into another industry, also they can work in space industry. So when they have to come to space industry, they need to be reoriented. And some kind of a skill development is needed in this regard. So as an industry, we also taken up the skill development, not only our industry, many industries in the country, and the universities, the skill development has become the order of the day to change them from a, a curriculum to a, a finish useful for an industry. That we have many programs in the country. And as of now, we don't find it difficulty, but as we go along, yes, there could be some difficulty, but the government is working very hard towards that. Thank you. Okay, well look, I think on that though, we'll, we'll close it off. We've been going uh, just on 90 minutes as we, as we close off. Um, We've covered as much as we can. Um, we are going to have another episode on space and hopefully uh, we can have some of these panellists back uh, as well, or at least dive a bit deeper into a particular program. I think it would be well worthwhile. So look, thank you very much to Dr. Sabaya Rayo Pavaluri, Founder, Chairman and Managing Director for Ananth Technologies there in Hyderabad. Uh, Dr. Malcolm Davis, Senior Analyst, Australian Strategic Policy Institute in Canberra. Yochi Kamiyama, the policy researcher for the Japan Institute for Space and Security in Tokyo, and Glenn Tyndall, the CEO for Communication Systems for Electro Optic Systems EOS, uh, also in Canberra. Thank you very much to our panel uh, for each of you doing a great presentation as well uh, and a bit of a Q&A uh, also. So thank you so much. Um, just to finish off, this particular session is recorded and I'm just wondering where to my next slide one second. Here we go. It's available on it will be available on My Security TV. We covered off some of the key events. Next week we will cover off on uh, infrastructure. At, at this stage it's uh, we'll be covering off on drones and anti-drone technology uh, as we put and finalize that panel together. Uh, Roman, any takeaways before we close this session? Uh, collaboration. <laughs> we need to have a joint working group so we could have a proper uh, separate discussions on this. There are a lot of opportunities I can see in collaborating from uh, the land of rising sun in Japan to land of happy new year in Australia and India. There's one word in India called Brahmand. That means we are not looking at moon and Mars. There's a huge mm -hmm. new world galaxy beyond this galaxy. Earth is just a small part of the whole dot. We have a big ocean to discover. Thank you to you. Thank you. Um, to the audience uh, and anyone looking at the video later on, if you want to somehow get involved, if you're in the space program and uh, want to contribute any particular information, please do so. We'll have downloads to the presentations that Henry uh, shared on the show notes and otherwise there's a couple of handouts there 
that you can grab before we close. Thank you very much to our panel, uh, very worthwhile. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us for episode four of our Indo-Pacific series. We'll see you next week. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste.